So welcome back everybody. We're going to now be going to chapter four, which is the emergence of thought and language cognitive development in infancy and early childhood. So in chapter three, we went over motor development, we went over the brain, the theory of mind, perception, senses. So now we're going to go over how do we learn language and how does thought and language and cognitive development begin. So that's what chapter four is about. And let's just dive in. Let's begin this chapter with some questions about the thought process of infants. Since babies cannot speak, can we tell what they are thinking? How does cognition develop? How do children master language in order to express their thoughts? It's pretty amazing that when you look at a baby, they have no, you know, no communication, right? Except for crying. And then to what we are as an adult. How did we get there? Where did it all start and how did it all begin? So we're going to begin with the onset of thinking. We're going to go back to Piaget and we're going to look at his account. So our learning objectives are, according to Piaget, how do schemes, assimilation, and accommodation provide the foundation for cognitive development? How does thinking become more advanced during the sensory motor stage? And what are the distinguishing characteristics of pre-operational thinking? So remember I told you we're going to come back why learning those theories were so important because now we're going to apply them to the actual uh, age group. So let's dive in and see. Let's begin with Piaget and see what he thought on the subject. We'll also dive in and look at what are the criticisms of Piaget's theory and how have contemporary researchers extended Piaget's theory. So that's why it's so important to continue research and have valid, reliable research so that you can apply it to the masses. So we can understand the more we know, the more we have at our tools to assess between, you know, Physiologically, with our brain MRIs and our observation, we know more knowledge, then we can make better um, research designs and we can make better assumptions and better applications. So we're going to take a look at all of that in this first part of chapter four. So let's begin and review Piaget's cognitive development. So if you remember, according to Piaget, children understand the world through schemes and a scheme are mental or psychological categories or structures that organize experiences. They allow the child to organize and put categories to their actual experiences. So for example, when a child sees forks, knives, spoons, the category, the scheme will be things I eat with. When they see dogs, cats, goldfish, the scheme will be pets. So just remember Piaget, what his theory was based on, that we learn because they're infants, children, as we learn, they're little scientists creating theories on how the world works. So as we review and look at the slide here, so infants group items based on what actions they can perform on them. So sucking, grasping, very basic. They have this mental category. Even if they can't communicate it, they're starting to categorize that. They're starting to learn. As they develop, preschoolers group by function or concept. So like I talked about earlier, things I eat with, or those are pets. And older children and adolescents group by abstract categories. Because remember, as we remember those Piaget videos, as they progress through his stages, they learn more, of, you know, they change from concrete to abstract. So as they understand abstract, they can understand abstract categories. So activities I love, maybe I love, you know, swimming or art, you know, they can put it into more of an abstract. So just remember this, infants are actions. Their schemes are actions, sucking, grasping, um, et cetera. Preschoolers are function or concept. So those are things I eat, pets. Um, and older children are abstract categories like I activities I love. And also remember, children's theories are incomplete because they haven't had as many experiences. You know, we're always making more categories, even today, right? If, we, if we're exposed to something new. But children's are very incomplete. 
but they help make the world predictable. So they start the foundation of cognitive development because they begin to group things and make the world make sense. So it's the basic part of cognitive development are these schemes because they're going to categorize them. And as you develop, they'll get more um, detailed, like as the older children can do the abstract. Just remember that this is how it allows for the early part of cognitive development because they can start grouping the world to make it make sense so they can start function and predict behavior and we're going to go and look a little bit more at this so let's take a look how these schemes develop how do we go from that infant to the preschooler and how do we how does that cognitive um, development start to group those categories right so there's there's uh three there's two things you want to know so there's assimilation and accommodation. So when you're thinking about these schemes and how does they group these categories, you want to think Piaget, assimilation, accommodation. So what are they? Assimilation is, according to Piaget, taking in information that is compatible with what is already known. So an example of that would be a, a grasping scheme. So they work on, so a baby may work on blocks and then toy cards and then new objects. So they know that they use this grasping, that would be the scheme. And then they realize, oh, I can grasp a, a block and a, and a toy car. I can grasp objects. So it, it extends to new objects. So that would be assimilation. So a grasping scheme is incorporating new experiences. So as they start to play with new toys, they realize that I can not only just grasp a block, I can grasp a car, I can grasp a stuffed animal. Um, extending new item, new objects into that scheme. So that's what assimilation is, is, is making it broader. So pulling in new things. Accommodation, our schemes are modified based on new experiences. So they changing, so according to Piaget, changing existing knowledge based on new knowledge. So how, how does that work? So we use the example of butterflies and moths. So at first the, First scheme might be these are flying, small flying objects, right, with wings. You know, we, that's the baby categorizes it. But as they accommodate, they're modified on new, new experiences. So now he sees a moth and they start to see the butterfly and they notice that they're different. Then they're taking in that new information and they're categorizing it and actually delineating what the difference is. Another example of accommodation is that uh, when they're first learning to pick something up, they may learn to you that an object's too heavy by lifting with one hand, that they need two hands to lift it. So they're accommodating, they're modifying their knowledge of that. Okay, oh, I can always lift blocks with one hand. Oh, but that's not the same weight. I've learned that not all blocks weigh the same. So because all, not all blocks weigh the same, I have to change the way I lift them. So I may use two hands. That's accommodation. So. They're modified based on new experiences. So you're learning about the environment, learning about the objects, learning about people in the environment, and your brain is constantly changing these schemes to, uh, to figure out where they fit and make sense of the world. So remember that schemes are constantly changing and adjusting to children's experiences. So that's why it makes development, right? If they just stayed the same, they would never learn new activities. They would never understand the way that not only do we interact with the environment, but how does an environment act with that? So they're, getting, they're learning the shape, the feel, the weight of objects, how they fit you know, into a room. They're learning all that. They're using their motor, their sensory, their vision, their hearing. They're taking all that information, putting it in these little categories, and then as they experience life, they're modifying the category. So they're assimilating it, um, either putting it into an existing category, realizing, okay, I, I, all objects I can pick up with, you know, I can grasp, that's my grasping, or they're accommodating. Oh, I have about 20 blocks, but they're one's heavy, some are light, some need one hand, some need two. I'm accommodating, I'm modifying. So they're constantly changing. Uh, but the importance is they need, you need to be in balance between assimilation and accommodation. So you need to have a balance between bringing in existing um, new experiences into existing schemes or and balance between accommodating, modifying those schemes. So if a child spends more time in accommodating than assimilating, then they're going to lose equilibri equilibration. So 
What that basically means is that outmoded way of thinking are replaced by different, more advanced schemes. And that usually occurs at approximately 2, 7, and 11 years of age. So with equilibration, what would be an example is a lot of times in math or science when you, you're taught a new concept, but you don't even understand the original concept. So if you were taught, um, you're going to be taught, say, the um, algebra. But you algebra two, but you never learned any algebra, so you don't have a scheme for algebra. <laughs> so how would you even know algebra two? So that's what you've learned. You you need to go back and then you take away the old schemes of stuff and you learn the new scheme for algebra two. So then that would be a new way of thinking, and you've replaced your old basic math and you've learned a new updated math, so that you think things a, a whole different way. So now you've taken that out modeled way of thinking. So usually that happens at 2, 7, 11, because those are big changes. And um, think about 2, really starting to come into the world, can walk, talk, you know, starting to really um, interact with your, you know, environment, 7, school age, right, and 11, right before puberty. So a lot of those have big changes um, in your schemes. So just remember when you leave this, assimilation is adding new details to what is already known. And a combination is altering the scheme based on the understanding of new knowledge. And that equilibration happens when you're out of balance, so that equilibrium, right? When you're spending more time accommodating instead of assimilating. So when you're modifying your schemes too much, you don't understand what the original scheme was. So then you start getting just rid of it and say, I need a new scheme because I've modified that one too much. I need a new scheme with updated information. And that is um, basic cognitive development, according to Piaget. So let's look at some examples of assimilation. This baby will learn that many objects can be grasped easily with one hand, illustrating assimilation, but will also discover that bigger, heavier objects can be grasped only with two hands, illustrating accommodation, which we talked about in the last slide. So let's review Piaget's cognitive development because we need to really understand where it starts and originates. So remember, he has four stages and, and the associated age. So you see the sensi sensorial motor, it's infancy, which is birth to two years. And in this stage, the baby learns to coordinate actions and develop object permanence. The use of reflexes, normal ref Newborn reflexes are present, and these reflexes continue to at least four months, being repeated as a primary circular reaction, and creates pleasures for the infants. From ages four to eight months, the infants begin using actions that are intentional. So up until about four to eight months, there's a lot of just, you know, reflexive, not um, purposeful movement at about, so remember this, at about eight to um at about four to eight months, actions become intentional with purpose, four to eight months. And then between eight and 12 months, the actions are used to reach goals. So that, so think about your eight and 12 month old, right? So they're starting to, maybe they're crawling, they're walking, they can actually realize that if I wanna get that toy, oh, my action, if I crawl over there, I can get, achieve my goal. So about eight to 12, they can start to put that together that if I do this action, I can attain the goal that I want. At 12 to 18 months, the baby begins exploring and trying new things, right? They're, most, they should be walking by now so they can actually go explore their environment. The environment isn't this contained area. This is when all the parents go crazy, right, because they can't contain their kids. But they can actually explore and try new things because their environment is not limited by their locomotion skills. They're actually very mobile, so they can go to the environment. And between 18 and 24 months, the use of language and replication is common. And that's when object permanence is well developed. And we'll go over all that. So pre-operational stage, which is preschool and early elementary school years. So remember that's two to six years. And the child uses language to facilitate thought. Magical thinking is present, so that's a lot of, you know, imagination, maybe imaginary friend. They talk a lot of stories that may not um, make sense, but um, they're starting to put that magical thinking. They believe in fairy tales and princesses. You take them to Disneyland, right? They believe that is the real prince. So 
logical thinking is not mature at this age. So remember that this is magical thinking, imaginative, let you starting to use language, but um, logical thinking is not mature. Two to four years of age, the child is egocentric. So egocentric means all about me. So think about your two-year-old. I always say this, picture your two-year-old. What's their favorite thing? Me. Me, 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 and no, no, no. So everything is him and the world revolves around him. So think of that typical two-year-old egocentric me. Between four and seven, the child is less egocentric with awareness of thoughts and, the, and has the ability to see others' perspectives. So that's when they can start to empathize a little bit and realize that other people may be affected by their actions or have feelings as well. But about two, you know, two to four, there's that egocentric me, me, me. And then in concrete operational stage is middle and late elementary school years, and that's seven to 11 years. And the child thought process is logical. So that's when they begin to have that logical thought. And at this age, the child is able to classify um, and their understanding is literal. So if you say, you know, oh, you know, like I, you know, I'm so tired. I, you know, I sleep on a bed of rocks. It's very literal, right? Oh, you sleep on a bed of rocks. It's not abstract. So you, you, you're actually going to sleep on a bed of rocks. And you're like, no, that's an abstract thought. That's a thing. So their understanding is very literal. So whatever you say is, is, is the words have meaning. So there's going to be exactly what they're most saying. So, but they can have logical thought. They can put A plus B and know that it equals C. So um, they're starting to understand that, but very literal, no abstract. And then formal operational is adolescence and adulthood. And that's 11 years and up. And thinking is abstract and logical. And the child has the ability to analyze and construct theories. So if you want to go see, remember in chapter one, I have those examples of Piaget uh, with the, each age group. So you can go back and look at that if you want to see examples again. But just think of that. You know, when you're an adolescent, you're thinking of your, you can think of your future. You can think of who am I going to marry? You know, you start thinking of that abstract thought. Um, in concrete operational, middle and late elementary school, you know, you're thinking, you can think logical, you, you know, you can reason but you can't always think of the what ifs. So it's very literal and concrete still. Not the what ifs, not that abstract. What if this happened? What if I did this? They can't think like that. Pre-operational is the me, 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 egocentric. You know, me, all about me, I'm that two year old. It starts to wean out as they get closer to six years old. And infancy is all about the environment, right? They're using their sensory and their motor skills to learn about the environment. And the more mobile they get, the um, more purposeful their actions get. So just remember some of those timelines I gave you uh, as you go through this chapter. Okay, so now that we've reviewed Piaget's theory, let's really dive in to birth to age two, sensory, sensory motor thinking. So basically adapting to and exploring the environment. When I think of zero to two, when you vision that child, they are using every sensory and motor. So their sensory and motor skills are coming in and they're using all that information to make sense of the world around them, to make those schemes, those categories, to understand not just people, but objects and how they interact and what that means and how they relate to them. So just to you know, oh, just think of they're, they're learning gravity and you know things, how things balance and what's up and what's down. If I shake this, it makes noise. They have no knowledge of that. All of that is learned. So everything is a lot of sensory, a lot of senses, motor skills, exploring your environment. So one of the things we want to go over is understanding what objects. So we don't, I mean, now you can, oh, I know what the object is. But to an infant, it's a huge and important thing to understand what does objects mean in my environment. They're not people. You know, they don't interact. So what does objects and how do I understand them. So one of the big concepts is object permanence. And what that means is the understanding acquired in infancy that objects exist independently of our actions. So basically that means that whether I'm here or not, that object is here. So if I leave the room, that object is still here. Whether I touch that object, it is still there. Whether I knock it over, that object is still there. So just thinking of an infant, just think like they know nothing. That is like going to outer space and we're thinking of going to some crazy, you know, uh, planet where nothing makes sense. 
you're trying to understand does it fall over can it float in the air can it you know what can an object do that if that infant doesn't understand any of that so they're learning through their environment through touching it hitting it seeing how it moves see how it responds to them so object permanence is very very important so a good um, example of object permanence is when you're playing peekaboo and you close your eyes so it's almost like you would disappear or if you had a, a stuffed animal so they are learning that the object still exists when they close their eyes so when they close their eyes when they haven't learned this object permanence thing they think that object disappears so that is a skill so the more that they really once they realize they're they are learning object permanence so it's kind of that idea out of sight out of mind hidden toys um, for example, eight months searches for a toy under a cloth. So if you looked at that Piaget, um, and if it's hidden underneath there, if it's hidden and it's out of sight, it doesn't exist. So until they get that object permanence about, you know, eight months, do they understand, oh, it's just under the cloth. It's not disappeared. So it's a huge thing to understand, and it's how they relate to the rest of their environment. So out of sight, out of mind. Um, basically, if you hide it, it's, it's gone, it's disappeared, like you're the best magician ever, right? So even at this, before they get that object permanence, even if it's, it's even limited, even if they see it move to another blanket, they will still look under the first. So that's a huge concept that they start to get at eight months, is um, knowing that where they put it is... Um, where it is and it starts at eight months but it's not fully understood until 18 months so between eight and 18 months is when they start to grasp the full concept of, of object permanence you may see it in one aspect but then you take it to use another toy or use and use another object and it may not carry over so just remember it begins at eight months and about until 18 months is it fully understood and um, perfected and I also want to point out at why 18 months is important as well. At about 18 months, most children are talking and gesturing, and they're using symbols to for words, and they do pretend play. So they're understanding the environment so much more around them. And you know, by 20 months, they're able to mimic and pretend um, to do things that they've seen other adults, their parents do, maybe like brushing their teeth and um, those ideas. So 18 months is a big age group, is a very important kind of milestone for understanding object permanence and beginning to really talk, gesture, understanding symbols um, for pretend play and that interaction. So just remember that. So now let's look at pre-operational -oper thinking. So this is a great table, great one to study off for a test, okay? Uh, so let's look at the characteristics of pre-operational thinking. So remember, it's egocentrism is one of the main ones. And that's when um, the child believes that all people see the world as he or she does. So it's me and you guys are just, you know, in it. So what I think, if I think the earth is square, everybody must think the earth is square. If I like chocolate, everybody likes chocolate because I like chocolate. They can't even imagine somebody else not liking or doing what they can't. They just can't. Their brain is not developed yet to understand that so it's not that it's just they don't have the, the development the connections to understand that concept so an example would be a child gestures during a telephone conversation not realizing the listener cannot see the gestures right so they're talking to grandma and they're you know moving their hands and doing all that stuff and then you have to remind them you know grandma can't see you it's a telephone but they think because they're doing it and it's about them they should be able to see it Centration is the second one in pre-operational thinking. It's a characteristic, and it, its definition is the child focuses on one aspect of a problem or situation but ignores other relevant aspects. So an example of that is in conversation of liquid quantity, a child pays attention to the height of the liquid in the beaker but ignores the diameter of the beaker. So that's that example video I showed you in the first week. So when they took the, the beaker and they showed the liquid and they poured it into a wider beaker, they thought there was more or less, um, depending on the height of that, that beaker, than it was in the original. When they know they didn't add any more, they can't understand that. So 
they focus on one aspect of a problem but ignore the relevant aspect. So they ignore that that container is changed size. They just look at it and say that looks like it has more liquid because it's you know it's higher in it's higher in height now. So the child pays attention to the height of the liquid in the beaker but ignores the diameter of the beaker. So go back to those videos if you're having problems with that and watch them in, in um, extra videos in chapter one because these really show these concepts. And then appearance as reality. So that means the child assumes that an object really is what it appears to be. So um, the example they give here is a child believes that a person smiling at another person is really happy, even though the other person is being mean. So maybe their appearance isn't reflecting actually what the thought is. Uh, another um, example is to say you put on some dark sunglasses and you looked at milk and it looked kind of tinted. An adult could tell that that's just because of the sunglasses. Um, but a child would think that the milk is really brown. Um, they can't distinguish that the um, object is different than what it appears. So whatever it looks like, it must be. They can't tell that it would be altered or have some other type of appearance. Whatever it is on face value is what it is. So just remember in this stage, children are, tend to be tentative and often incorrect in their assumptions. Because if they're thinking that the world is all around them, and that they can only see an object from a centration. They can only see it from one aspect. They can't defer, you know, see the difference. Um, and if parents is, are always what's real, which we know parents can be deceiving, right? That saying, that is pre-operational thinking. They cannot make, um, they don't have logical thinking and they can't see the other's perspective, okay? So they're often tentative and often incorrect in their assumptions. So this is the example that was shown in the videos in chapter one and just putting it in a figure, a picture. So this is pre-operational thinking at its best. So if you look at this, you can children in the pre-operational stage of development typically have difficulty solving conservation problems in which important features of an object or objects stay the same despite changes in physical appearance. So that's example, right? Liquid quantity. Is there the same amount of water in each glass? Yes, you can see they're equal. Pour some from one glass into a shorter, wider glass. Now is there the same amount of water in each glass or does one glass have more? A, a child in the pre-operational thinking would say the taller one has more. They cannot distinguish, right? That's that centration. I mean, that's that, yeah, that's that centration. That one aspect changing doesn't affect the other. They can't understand that that liquid didn't change, just the diameter. They can only see that height. They can't see the diameter part of it. Now we look at number. Are there the, are there the same number of pennies in each row? So then, yes, they look balanced, right? And then you stretch out the top rows of pennies, push together the bottom row. Now you remember in those videos, the kids would, a lot of the, the kids at this stage would say, no, they would say there are more on the top because there's length is, is longer than the bottom, not the amount, the length is. So they can't tell the difference between amount and length. They can't see that change. And then the last one is length. Are these sticks the same length? Yes, they're equal, you can see. But when you move them, they can't tell the difference because now the bottom one looks longer. So they can not They can only see one dimension. They can't see two and understand, oh, they're the same one and change. Not until they get into the concrete operate uh, concrete stage so pre-operational thinking is remember that that centration this is an example go back and watch those videos of real kids and it really makes it make sense so here are just some more examples of con conservation problems that are typically difficult to solve in children in pre-operational stage because of centration they have tunnel vision they can only concentrate on one thing so if you change the if you change the other aspect they can't pull it together so we can look at mass and area so you have two exact same size clay balls um, so one the roll one out looks like a sausage now it is it's the same mass and the ball looks heavier because that's flattened they can't understand that you did not change the mass and then same thing with the area. So they have the squares there. And then you can see in the second one, you spread out the squares 
it looks like they have less grass because the squares are more um, spread out. But again, we know because we're not in this stage, but children in this stage just see the squares more more spread out that they think they have less grass. So that's that idea of centration. Tunnel vision and only can concentrate on one thing. Preoperational phase Piaget, age two to six. Visualize that kid. Go back and watch those videos. Very, very, um, make it very, very much come to life. So now that we've gone over Piaget's theory of cognitive development in infants and young adolescents and children, let's look at some of the common criticisms of Piaget's theory. So the first one is underestimates cognitive competence in infants and young children and overestimates competence in adolescents. So infants have a greater understanding of objects than Piaget thought. So through research, they realized that actually infants can understand objects better than he thought. So by using tasks more sensitive than Piaget, so they developed a better test, they learned from him, and so by doing the research, they learned from him, developed a better test. Scientists have shown that infants and toddlers are more capable than expected on, his, on Piaget's theory. For example, you understand, you'll see that infants understand objects more than Piaget believed. In contrast, Piaget overestimated those cognitive skills in adolescents with, whose reasoning is often not as sophisticated as expected by formal operational principles. So infants actually understand objects better um, when they see it. So there's actually, we'll show you some slides of how they tested that, but that's through extended research they found that. So the second criticism is Piaget's theory is vague concerning process of change. So what does that mean? So many key components of the theory, such as accommodation and assimilation, are too vague to be tested scientifically. So consequently, scientists abandon them in favor of other cognitive processes that can be evaluated more readily and therefore could provide more convincing accounts of children's thinking. Because they're so vague, no one researched it, so we don't really know, you know, well, how, you know, how much do people really, how much do infants in them really accommodate or assimilate? Since they can't scientifically be tested or easily used or easily proven or disproven. So that's another criticism. The third criticism, criticism is they said that he does not account for variability in performance. So in Piaget's view, each stage has a unique characteristic that leaves their mark on everything a child does. Right? So for example, egocentrism and centration in preoperational thinking. Consequently, children's performance on different tasks should be consistent. So, for example, on conversation, conservation and the three um, mountain tasks. So, if a child was to look at a mountain and choose the one that you know looks most like him, a four-year-old should always respond in a preoperational way. So, he should be consistent in his preoperational way, no matter what you give him. He should say that water is not the same after pouring, when you do the pouring. He should say it's always not the same after pouring and that another person sees the same, the same mountain, the mountain the same way he does. Um, in fact, the child's thinking may be more sophisticated in some domains, but not even others. And why do you think that? So let's just say like, okay, so they show these pictures of, um, so let's say that we have the water, right? And say that this child grew up with a family that bakes in the kitchen. And he's been exposed in his environment to doing a lot of measuring. And he understands that when I pour that in there, I understand that, um, oh, it doesn't, it's the same. Because I've been taught, I've been exposed, I learned that. But then you take something like, um, I'm showing you the clay. I may, because it's clay now, I, I haven't been around clay. So when I see that flatten, oh yeah, that's, that is actually more mass than that. Because that doesn't make any sense to me. So what he's saying and the, the critics are saying is that, if, if Piaget was true and it was scientifically proven that no matter what example you gave, like if it was the water, the pennies, um, you showed the clay being smashed, they would always answer in a pre-operational way. They would never get it right. But what critics are saying is that life isn't like that. You have exposures to other things in your environment where you might learn one aspect, where you might learn 
um, volume. You might understand that because you've been exposed to it and learned it, but you may not understand mass or area. So it doesn't carry over. So that's what they're saying is a criticism of it. They don't always um, respond just like a pre-operational because you can be taught specific things during this stage um, and understand that specific skill um, where you could answer correctly, but your thinking is uh, not always going to show pre-operational. And then the last one is that he undervalues the influence of the sociocultural environment. So we talked a little bit about this, that um, Piaget describes a child as a lone scientist, right? He's this lone scientist discovering the world and making cognitive um, schemes and putting everything into category. And he's just by himself, like categorizing, categorizing the world on his own perception. But more often than not, right, a child's effort to understand the world is socially um, affected by his environment, mom and dad, where he lives, you know, all the, all the social cultural influences. So he's not a lone scientist all by himself discovering many, many influences. So the growing understanding of the world and his cognitive development is influenced by interactions with family members, peers, and teachers. And it takes place against the you know background of the cultural values that are represented. So we don't live in a bubble. This little child is not like we're not in a scientific lab exposing it to you know sterile environment. No, it's in real life, real environment, and it's influenced by his parents, where he lives, what country, what culture, you know, farming, coal, weather, all of that is affects the um, the learning for the infant and the child. So. Piaget did not ignore these social and cultural changes, cultural forces, but he did not emphasize them. So he didn't really address them or emphasize them too much. He didn't completely ignore them. He may have mentioned them, but he didn't give them great value. He undervalued the influence of social cultural environment. So after discussing the critics of Piaget, let's ask the question, do children act as scientists as believed by Piaget? Well, according to the core knowledge hypothesis, children are born with basic knowledge of the world and it is elaborated based on experience. So that means that children's first theories concern physics, biology, and psychology. So we're gonna go over the uh, what they call naive physics and naive biology and the psychology part is the theory of the mind talked about in chapter three. But let's talk about naive physics and naive biology. So infants and children create reasonable, accurate theories of basics of how some objects will act is naive physics. So basically they know that an object is going to, if I hit it, it's going to fall over. If it's dropped, it's going to go down and not up. So that's the basis of naive physics. So although infants know that they're expecting an object to fall um, because of naive physics. They just don't know why. That's what makes it a higher level thought. So in elementary school, when maybe know they fall due to gravity and a physics student in college or high school may know because it's the force of gravity equals the mass of object times, you know, acceleration caused by gravity. So there's the progression of that thought. So naive physics is just a basic understanding that that object, if I drop it, will fall to the ground. I don't know why. I don't know the equation. I just know that that. So that's naive physics. Um, so some properties of objects aren't learned until after infancy. And um, for example, not until the preschool years do children understand ownership, that people can acquire objects by receiving them as gifts or by buying them or creating them. But, how, but remember that infants and toddlers rapidly create a reasonable, accurate theory of some basic properties of objects, which helps them predict how objects such as toys will act. So it's just how they interact. Some basic, basic naive physics is what that object will do if it's knocked over, if it's dropped, if I hit it, if it moves like a toy car. So that's basic, basic naive physics. Infants also have an understanding of naive biologies, which is the understanding of healing and growth, right? That objects do not heal themselves and do not grow, 
that living things heal and grow. So like they get taller, they get bigger, they get a scratch on their arm, it'll heal. That if they get a puppy, it becomes a dog, it gets bigger. Um, so during this preschool year, children's naive theories of biology expands to include many specific properties associated with living things, particularly when they have daily contact with animals. So animals is a big thing, right? Because they can see them grow. They can see that they have, you know, they have internal parts, um, that they look like their mom and dad, that they can heal, right? So that's by the time they're four years, children's understanding of living things is so sophisticated that children aren't fooled by lifelike objects. They aren't fooled by robots and they aren't filled, you know, by um, things that are made to look human. So that's kind of the progression of biology but just remember infants they can just tell that something is um and toddlers use motion to identify animate objects and by 12 to 15 months they have determined that animate objects are self-propelled and can move an irregular path and can act to achieve goals so they can tell that that a, a person or a living object an animate object can move itself and can make goals and react where inanimate object which is a you know just a toy or something else cannot so that's the basics an infant progresses into preschool when they can understand about living things and then progresses all the way into about four years old where they understand that like a robot is not a living thing so we're going to look a little bit more at these on the next slide so just remember that research shows that babies understand objects at an earlier age than shown by piaget so they Researchers have found that four and a half month olds show some understanding of object permanence and that five months olds expect li liquids to change shapes and that a naive theory of physics is formed even by infants. So even infants can understand on a very rudimentary basic level that, you know, some understanding of object permanence, some understanding that if, you know, you drop a, a block, it'll go downward, not upward. So very, very naive, um, basic, basic um, theory of physics is formed even by infants. So that's what research has shown um, in criticism to Piaget. So they have shown a little bit more of that knowledge earlier in infants. So let's take a look at an example of that. So this is naive um, theory. So we're going to look at this. Um, object permanence. So we're going to look at a little bit about that, them understanding it earlier than Piaget thought. Okay. So if you look at the first uh, figure there, uh, the silver screen is lying flat on the table and the red box is fully visible. And then the second one, it shows that the silver screen has begun to rotate, but the red box is largely visible. And then the third, you see the silver screen is now vertically blocking the red box. And in the fourth, the silver screen continues to rotate, blocking the red box, which has started to drop through the trap door. And on number five step, the silver screen is completely flat, apparently have rotated through the red box, which is actually now under the table. And in number six, you see the silver screen is rotating back toward the infant, but still blocks the red box. And number seven, the silver screen is again flat and the box fully visible to the infant. So what this has shown is that that infants, so they look at the faces and expressions of infants to determine this. And what they found that infants are surprised to see that the silver screen um, rotates flat, which suggests that they understand that the permanence of the red box. So they understand that that box shouldn't disappear, that it should be there because that it is an object. So that's kind of, they're surprised that there's a trap door, right? So they, they're surprised that it's gone. They anticipate it being there. So that's a, a suggestion, because they're just going off, you know, looks, that they understand a little bit about the permanence of the red box. And then you can see that this is a, based on a three and a half to four and a half month old infant. And this is part of that naive um, physics. So by 12 to 15 months, toddlers understand several properties of animate, animate objects. And animate objects are people, things that move, things that are real living things. Uh, 
And by age of four, several elements compose a naive theory of biology. So we talked a little bit about this earlier. Growth. Animate objects get bigger with time, right? Dogs are humans. Internal parts. Um, humans have blood and bones while a rock does not. Inheritance. Living things resemble their parents. And healing. Their own hair will grow back while their dolls will not. If they got a scratch, you know, they put a scratch on their doll, it doesn't miraculously heal, but theirs will. Um, so just remember that by 12 to 15 months, they determine that animate objects self-propel, move in irregular patterns, and can act to achieve goals. So we talked a little bit about that earlier. And that only living things can have offspring. That's inheritance. Um, so if a dog is, you know, brown, you could ask a kid what color um, was the mom, and they would say brown. So they understand that they look similar. And by age four, so remember, by age four, they realize robots are... Um, aren't human, they aren't alive, and they don't eat or grow, okay? Um, so those are things to kind of review, but remember that that's the naive theory of biology, okay? So you have a naive theory of biology, a naive theory, which is, you know, these, in, these um, the random objects move, grow, you know, inherit, heal. You have the naive theory of physics that is that object. So think about Object permanence, so they can they start to understand earlier than we thought, four and a half, three and a half to four and a half months that objects are are permanent. Like they just because they're hidden doesn't mean they don't exist. And that if you drop something, it'll it'll go downward and not upward. Or if you knock something over, it'll go down. That's that naive physics. And then naive psychology is more theory of the mind, what we learned in chapter three. So now that we understand and we've discussed how infants begin to do their cognitive development through assimilation, accommodation, making their schemes, organizing the environment around them into schemes and categories to make sense of their world and their environment. And as they develop motorly with motor skills, the more environment they are exposed to, the more schemes they have, the more they have to accommodate and assimilate, and the more they can understand of the world. So we kind of understand that process. We discussed it. Let's look at how do they take in now all this information and make sense of it. So we're going to look at information processing during infancy and early childhood. And some of our learning objectives we'll be going over in this section is what is the basis of the information processing approach? So what does that mean? We'll go over that. How well do young children pay attention? Think about young children. Are they like, can they, can they do activities for a long period of time or short bursts? And does it depend on the child? What kinds of learning takes place during infancy? Do infants and preschool children remember? I want you to think about when your first memory was. And what do infants and preschoolers know about numbers? So some of the stuff we just, you know, I do you remember learning to talk? Do you remember not knowing numbers? You know, all that stuff. We're going to learn. There's a process. It's amazing the way our brain works. And when you understand how we learn how it's our language and our numbers and how we process information, you're going to have a whole new appreciation on interacting with children and infants and the progression through the school age years and why it's so important to develop these skills early on. So let's take a look. So general principles of information processing. So this is, you want to think of like that computer, right? I'm kind of borrowed from a computer science. So when we think of information processing, think of your computer that you have that you're working on right now, probably, and think how that processes. I think if you correlate that with this theory, you're going to understand it a little bit better. So human thinking is based on mental hardware. Um, so that's your hardware and your computer, right? So that our mental hardware are mental and neural structures that are built in and that allow the mind to operate. So remember all the things we learned in, earlier in this semester about how the, the brain has laid all the framework. We have all the neurons. We just need to make those connections, right? Those um, synaptic connections. So we, the hardware is the brain, the neurons just waiting 
for the processor to come in and lay down the program. Okay, so the mental software are the programs. So someone's got to tell the, the um, hardware what to do, right? It's all there, but someone's got to program it and tell it what to do. So that's what our mental software is. It's the mental programs that are the basis for performing particular tasks. So if you're thinking of the computer, you have your hardware, which is our brain and our neurons right in there. And you have all these little neurons waiting to get some information. Think of the, the environment or your experiences as a programmer. And they're going to say, just like you were going to learn, someone's going to program a new code. So maybe you guys have learned code. You're going to tell the hardware what to do, right? So your computer will play your game. I'm going to make a, an app for, you know, I don't know, a, uh, a beauty game or something. i got to tell that hardware. All hardware is all there. I've got to tell it what to do. So that's what the same thing with the brain. The brain is your mental hardware. The environment or the experiences is the programmer. And through that, they're going to tell the brain what to do. So through that experiences, they're going to lay down those synapses, make connections, and that's going to become the program. So there's going to be a program for riding a bicycle. Um, there's going to be a program for, you know, um, writing, for speaking, for talking, for uh, running. There's going to be a program for understanding language. There's going to be a program for skipping. So anything that you can do, there has to be set a program. And if then if there never is a program, if that person never gets programmed or has the environment experiences, they won't have the um, the mental so software. So it's just like thinking that computer. Oh, I got to bring up my word program. Oh, I got to bring up my running program. My brain's going to bring it up in that hardware. So if you think of it like a computer, it's going to make it much more easier to understand. Information processing theory is your computer theory. Um, they can become the structures become more complex, powerful, and efficient as children develop have new experiences, right? As you progress in the game, think of like Atari. I don't even know if you guys know Atari, but that's what I had when I was a kid. To the graphics and the video games now. So that was pretty basic programming, but now the programming is like way, way, way high tech, almost lifelike. Same thing, think of a child as that Atari basic programming and an adult is your, you know, PlayStation 4 or 2 or whatever the heck is out there now um, with the graphics that look, you know, lifelike. That is what the progression of um, experiences, the environment, and laying down all those new programs is going to make it much more efficient. So we'll take a look a little bit more as we go. So now let's take a look at attention. I'm going to pose this question and then we're going to go back to it after we discuss it a little bit. I want you to think while we're discussing attention, how do babies living in cities sleep through the night with the sound of traffic? So before we can answer that, we need to understand well, what is attention? Attention is defined as a process that determines which information is processed further by an individual. So what does that mean? <laughs> so let's break it down into two parts. So the first part is orienting response, and that is the stimulus. So that is the unfamiliar stimulus produces a change in heart rate and brain waves. So that's that loud noise. That's that um, siren. That's the sh you know door being you know loud knock on the door. It's a stimulus that is unfamiliar. So think of an infant. And they're, say they grew up in the, a quiet neighborhood and they're traveling to the city of San Francisco and it's very noisy outside. Can you think of the atmosphere around it? They, the family has just moved there. They may, baby may have slept through the night out in the sur suburbs, but now they're in the city. He has, this baby has a new orienting response. What kind of sounds do you think are unfamiliar? Possibly sirens, honking horns, loud music, um, you know, people talking, you know, all the different things that are not familiar in the suburbs. So the baby, the infant, is orienting its response. It's becoming aware of potential dangers 
and events in the environment. So as it does this, it's devoting a lot of energy um, figuring out what is um, dangerous and what's not. So what is a baby's really strong? They're going to cry. They may be fussy. They're going to have a lot of strong response to the stimulus because they have no framework to base this on. They can't, they don't have the experience. They don't have the, the heart, the, the uh, mental software or the scheme yet to categorize what's the potential danger and what's not. So as they, let's look at this same question a month after this family has lived in this nice town in the city of San Francisco, what do you think you're going to see? Well, that baby is going to accommodate. It's going to get used to those sounds because it, it's put it in the correct schemes. It has noticed what is useful and what is not, what is potentially dangerous and what is not. And it's learned that even though I hear that siren, I know I'm safe. So I can just block it out. And that is habituation. It's the diminished response to a stimulus once it becomes familiar. So like that sound of traffic, the sirens, the sound of traffic. That's how they can sleep with noise. And that's how we do as well. And we go live our life through all the loud noises in the environment. Our body has, our brain has put them into schemes and we have learned what is useful and not, what is potentially dangerous and what is not. So that our brain does not devote too much energy to insignificant events and we can concentrate and pay attention. So could you imagine if you did not have habituation and your brain heard every single, and trying to process every single noise, sensation, everything you're hearing, and still do the task? Almost impossible, right? So that's why uh, attention and how we eliminate noise and stimulus is so important in having a good intention. So let's look at a preschool now. We're talking about an infant. So think of your typical preschool. How well is their attention? Do they have great attention overall? Probably not. They get very distracted, right? They're still in the process of learning um, habituation and depending on the task at hand and maybe a lot of unfamiliar stimulus as they change environments, go to school, go to different places. So how can we help preschoolers pay more attention? So one of the greatest things they can do they found is pretend play and role playing to show correct behavior. So if you're playing with a child and you want them to pay attention to this activity, this coloring, you mimic and you show um, how to do it. Or you, you know, you play with them and you pretend play and you say, oh, we're going to play school today. Now, everybody pay attention. You know, we're going to take this paper and I want you to, you know, do these three things and keep your mind focused on me. So you role play so that they understand how to um, pay attention. You have to teach children how to pay attention how to focus their, you know, their um, attention on a stimulus, on a project, and block out the other uh, unfamiliar stimulus and not get distracted. Uh, they found in studies that they also, that preschoolers also learn to concentrate. Um, they have difficulty concentrating when being distracted, right? So somebody's playing ball while they're trying to color it. So if, par if parents or teachers are queuing in when they see this distraction and bringing them right back to focus, that they have a better attention to task. They're learning how to be attentive to task. So through studies, you know, when they're distracted, if they have that immediate reinforcement um, to attention to task, they're actually going to learn how to be more attentive, be able to do to stay on task. So as they develop into older children, adolescents, and adults, they won't have as much problems with attention. So it actually can be a learned behavior. So it needs reinforcement. It needs uh, modeling for uh, with pretend play to really develop good attention habits. So as we're learning in Chapter 4, everything builds on each other. So infants begin their cognitive development with schemes, categorizing information of the environment to make sense of the world. Then we deal with attention and how to process that information through mental hardware and mental software, how to block out unnecessary noises and stimulus and to know what's important 
and what we need to pay attention to. Also that we can learn and develop. So how does learning take place? It takes several forms and we're going to go over that. So what I want to ask you is what, how do you think a newborn first starts to learn? They imitate those around us, right? The, wrong, the ones that care for them the most. Newborns imitate an adult's facial expression, right? Uh, learning can also occur not just from imitation, but from habituation. And remember the last side, habituation means becoming less responsive to a stimulus that is presented frequently. So you get used to it and you categorize it as not harmful. So your brain can efficiently block it out. So an infant learns that the sound of a dog bark from the doorbell, initially this may startle them or cause fear, but after repeated events, the child is no longer reacts to that particular event. So maybe at first, the, you know, when the dog barks at the doorbell every time the child, you know, gets really cries or startles, but after the 50th time, the child realizes that's just the dog barking at the, at the doorbell. Nothing bad is going to happen to me. Nothing adverse is going to occur. I can just block that out and I don't cry or have that, you know, unwanted um, response. So habituation is a, a huge learning factor, especially for the infant, because it's a lot of sensory and motor, right? So just think of habituation is blocking out that unwanted stimulus, so a lot of sensory stimulus. So the huge way infants learn early on. Another way is classical conditioning, and some of this you're going to know just by living, and maybe you've heard of it. So classical conditioning is a neutral stimulus elicits a response originally produced by another stimulus. So the example here is running water makes an infant cry because he thinks he's getting a bath. So every time <laughs> um, he hears running water, he cries, um, because he associates that with his bath. Another um, example is, remember when the mom with breastfeeding with the head scratching? Baby after a time will nurse after the head is scratched. So he associates the, um, if the head is scratched while the mom is breastfeeding, um, don't even have to, she just starts to scratch his head and he starts looking for um, the breast. So that's conditioning. You put this, you put one sound with the action. So like we said, the running water, we associate it with the bath. So every time it's running water, he thinks it's a bath because you take a bath after it. And then every, eventually, he doesn't even have to, he's not even going to get in the bath. He just hears running water, thinks, you know, cries because he doesn't want a bath. Same thing with breastfeeding. Every time she breastfeeds, she scratches the head. And pretty soon, um, she just can scratch the head and the baby will start to open its mouth for breastfeeding. So it's that's called classical conditioning. Uh, a neutral stimulus elicits a response originally produced by another stimulus. Operate conditioning is changing the behavior by use of reinforcement given after the desired response is given. So this is a lot of what we know. Um, it's reward and punishment. We know a lot about operant conditioning. We talked a little bit about this in the earlier um, chapters. Uh, so reward and punishment determines the likelihood that the behavior will uh, reoccur. So the example is a baby will smile. Baby's smile is rewarded with a hug. Therefore, she will more likely smile in the future because you're giving a positive reinforcement. It could be the opposite. You know, you could be giving a punishment um, where um, every time the baby cry, uh, you know, throws his blocks, you know, like that toddler throws his blocks, you put them in timeout. So they're learning that every time they do that behavior, something, a punishment occurs. So they're less likely to that, do that behavior. So it could be positive and reward, or it could be, you know, negative and taking something away. But it's some kind of um, change in behavior to get the desired response. And so you're thinking about a rela relationship between the behavior. So you do one thing, you reward this, and therefore they, they're going to do that more, or you take something away so that they're going to, to punish, and they're less likely to repeat that negative event. And that's what we tend to think of when we think of um, conditioning. That's operant conditioning. And classical conditioning is just, you know, pairing that sound. So eventually they, um, they don't even need that action with it to, 
to elicit the response. So think of the water with the bath with the baby who hates baths. The running water, he associates, he gets a running water every time he gets to the bath. That's when it starts it. And pretty soon, doesn't even have to go to the bath. Just has any running water because every time he takes a bath, he hears running water. So he associates that with baths, which he hates. So he cries. And that is classical conditioning. So know the two differences and know the three learning forms and understand uh, how that affects learning, how that is a form of learning. So these are just some pictures of examples that we talked about in the earlier slides. So remember imitation, the form of learning. Infants are able to imitate adult facial expressions. Young children imitate baby behaviors of others. So sticking your tongue out, smiling, this type of things, the babies will mimic all those facial expressions. So that's one, especially infants, right? That's one way that they definitely um, start a very, very basic starting to uh, learn. At about 10 months, they're able to wave or knock down blocks, and older children can hold spoons and video games. At two months, they may imitate facial expressions. So usually by two months, they're imitating, they're actually learning. Other times they could be just be reflexive, uh, but at two months they're starting to think it's more um, intentional. It's very hard to prove, but that's what the research has kind of alluded to, is that about two months they're actually starting to initiate um, intentional in, you know, um, imitation of facial expressions. So now that we've discussed how we learn, we need to discuss how do we re retain what we learn? How do we create memories? So there are three important features of memory in young babies. Number one is events from the past are remembered. Number two, over time events are no longer recalled. Number three, cues prompt memories that seem to have been forgotten. So let's use the example that's in your textbook to fully understand what that means. So we're the examiner and we're going to test memory in a two to three year old month. So we're going to bring a mobile and we're going to attach a string to that baby's foot. And what's going to happen is that baby's going to learn that when it kicks its foot, it's the mobile moves. So that's the event. That's the memory we are creating. Kicking the foot moves the mobile. So we take our mobile with us, we're the experimenter, and we return uh, in two days. And the infant still kicks. So that's number one, events from the past are remembered. So we were only away two, two days, the baby still remembers it. You tie the ribbon and it kicks it and the mobile moves. Now we're gonna wait three weeks and we're, as the experimenter, we come back, but the baby no longer kicks. That's number two. Over time, events are no longer recalled. However, if we remind the baby by moving the mobile without attaching the ribbon to the baby's foot, something triggers in the baby's memory and it remembers and the baby starts to kick its feet in anticipation of moving the mobile. And that's number three. Cues prompt memories that seem to have been forgotten. So that experiment demonstrated the process that memories are formed in young babies. Now I bet even us, we can recall when we have forgotten things and certain things have triggered us, a word, a smell, and it floods that memory right back. So it continues to work all the way through adulthood, but this is how it was initially developed. We're continually showing memories even early in adult in um, infants. Now why don't we remember all that? We're going to look at how memory improves as development progress progresses and it depends on the development of the memory areas in the brain and why that is so important and why even though we're creating memories why we're not retaining all the memories. So let's look at that. So I want you to know that growth in the brain regions that support memory are the hippocampus, amygdala, and prefrontal cortex. So the hippocampus and amygdala are involved in memory storage. So if you think about them, they're the, they're the little memory closets, so memory lockers. They're where you're all going to store all those little memories, put them in file cabinets to pull them out. 
The prefrontal cortex, which is in front of the brain, is the retrieval. So it's the little secretary that's going to go pull that memory out of the file and bring it to the to the forefront so that you have conscious thought of it. Okay. So without that little retrieval, you can have a hundred thousand memories but never remember it because you need someone to pull out the file. So if your little secretary in the front of your prefrontal cortex is is out sick, is damaged, <laughs> and can't get to that filing cabinet to pull out that memory, then you're not going to have functioning memory. So we need to understand when does that develop. So the brain structure is primarily responsible for the initial storage of information, which I said was the hippocampus, um, is one of them, developed during the first year. But structure is responsible for retrieving these stored memories, the frontal cortex, developed later during the second year. Um, and also part of the hippocampus is not mature until about 20 to 24 months. So development of memory during the first two years reflects the growth, growth in these two different brain regions. So you can imagine why we don't really remember, you know, when do memories really start to form? When can we really retrieve them? And it's because of the development of these two areas uh, and when we really develop it. So just remember, memory improves rapidly. We recall more and remember longer because the growth, brain, the growth um, of the brain regions responsible for memory continue to develop as we age and definitely aren't um, even mature until about 20 to 24 months of the hippocampus, which is the storage area. So let's look at some types of memory as we continue. So this is a picture that illustrates the memory centers in the brain that I was talking about. So you can see the hippocampus it's right up there in the front. You can see the amygdala. So those are your storage. Those are your filing cabinets with all your memories filed away. And then right, right in the front, you can see the prefrontal cortex. So that's, remember, that's your secretary, your administrative assistant that has to go retrieve those files in the, in the, from the hippocampus and the amygdala. And if it's not fully developed, if she can't get up and move, if she can't start, you know, get to those files, you're not going to have those memories pull up and remember. They may be there, but you, if you can't retrieve them, you can't make sense of them. So that is the, where they are located in the brain. So let's test your memory. Can you name your second grade teacher? I can. My teacher was Mrs. Archer, and I loved her, so I have great memories of her. Can you? Well, let's see what types of memories there are, and maybe that'll answer your question. So the first one is called autobiographical memory. And what that is, is people's memories of the experiences and events of their own life. So that makes sense. Autobiographical means um, about a, you know your own life, your autobiographical. So it first develops in the preschool years, and as a result, um, a result of basic memory skills that develop in infancy, language skills, and the sense of self. So we talked a little bit about those basic memory skills in infancy on the slide before. Um, and as we develop language skills, you're going to put it's going to make sense because you're going to put symbols, which is language, to the memory so that you can interpret it and retrieve it. And then to understand the sense of self, you're going to, it's going to lead to coherence and continuity to experience it. So you're going to understand what it means. So once you understand yourself in the world, then your memory can make sense. Else it's just a bunch of pictures and um with no content. It has no, um, it doesn't make sense because you're just looking at pictures where you don't understand what's in the picture. So it's like looking at a picture of aliens and alien objects and be like, I see that, but I have no understanding of what those, those are symbols that mean nothing. Once you can understand language, because language puts words or symbols to actions and feelings, that makes sense. When you understand yourself, you understand yourself in relation to other people and objects, then it becomes a movie. Instead of a picture with things you don't recognize, it becomes a movie with interaction and movement and feelings and thoughts, and you understand your perspective um, in relation to others. 
then it starts to make more sense. So then basic, then memories start to develop because it has a whole coherent picture. And then you also have your parents' conversations help build those basic memory skills because you listening to your parents talk and bring content to, to the situation and content to the actions to help understand what is happening. So as that memory is being laid, it has the create it has the correct uh, conversational meaning. It means something. And then just remember that open-ended questions result in more detailed memories. So if you're asking, you know, where did you go to on vacation and you have to describe that, then you're going to have a better memory. I went to Hawaii and we had, you know, we surfed and we rode the waves opposed to, did you go to Hawaii? Yes. That's not creating an image. It's not creating the, um, what you did. It's just a yes or no. So you're going to have way better, more detailed memories if people ask you open ended and have you describe because then you're painting the picture and as you paint that picture it laying down that memory in the storage area so i just want you to remember that autobiographical graphical memory refers to people's memory of significant events and experience of their own life so it's my memories autobiographical memory is involved with you remembering the name of your fourth grade teacher or how you spent the summer after high school graduation Autobiographical memory is important because it helps construct a personal life history and allows people to relate their experiences to others, creating socially shared memories. So, as you can see, you have a sense of self. and You understand the language and language means something to you. Then you can start to relate to others and then you can start having shared experiences and then you'll begin to have those autobiographical memories. And that's why it takes, you know, um, that's why you don't remember when you were two or three, because first of all, the connection, the prefrontal, uh, the connection from your uh, amygdala and your hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed. And also you do not have a full sense of yourself and, uh, your interaction with the environment isn't fully understood. So when you start to understand that, then you can start to lay down memories and begin to remember. So that's a lot of times people will chill, people will say their first memory is four, maybe three if they something particular, but four or five, because that's when really those skills are becoming uh, much more attuned. So look. Take a look at how valid is a child's memory. Can you count a child's memory as fact? Do they have the brain capacity to lay down correct information? And what does that mean in cases of child abuse? Uh, in particular, children's testimony. Is it accurate? So what they've looked at through studies is that preschoolers are suggestible. Which is true, right? If you've ever talked to a preschooler, you can almost convince them of something that didn't happen, right? So what they've determined, there's a way to get the most accurate memory out of young children. And one of the things that they found that can cause a lot of inaccuracies is leading questions are sometimes stored as false memories. So if you're leading, you know, leading them on, like, did you, did that guy hit you when you were crying? Like you're already giving them the answer in the question, then they're more likely to, you know, answer the way that they feel that you want to. And just remember, preschoolers are often confused about who said and what and did what. You know, they get people confused. Maybe who did the action, who exactly was the action, because they just do not have the, the brain is not, developed enough to fully lay down these memories because they don't have the context of the environment, you know, the experience to interpret it as a full memory. So we have to understand that and try to get the most out of these children to get the most accurate memory recall. So guidelines have, must be followed to ensure that preschoolers can provide reliable testimony. So what are those guidelines? So I'm going to go over those. So number one, and you need to know these for the test. Interview children as soon as possible after the event, right? It's, in general, that's a great rule for everybody, but especially children, so that the event is as fresh in their mind and they're going to tell you as 
much detail and as close to what really happened as, as possible. Number two, encourage children to tell the truth, to feel free to say, I don't know, and to correct interviews when they say something that's incorrect. So you need to preface the interview with that. Tell them, I want you to tell the truth. Let me know when you don't know. Tell me if I say something that's wrong uh, and correct me. Number three, they need to start by asking children to describe the event in their own words. So tell me what happened when you went and saw Uncle Bob. <laughs> okay, so tell me what happened after school. You want to follow up with open-ended questions. Can you tell me more about what happened while you were walking home? So don't put any of the leading questions in there, any of the things that you are trying to get an answer for. Don't lead with, did someone hurt you when you were walking home? So avoid specific questions because they may suggest to children's events that did not happen. So you want them to tell them in their own words. And fourth, ask questions that consider alternative explanations of the event. I explanations that don't involve abuse. So clearly when you were walking home, you tripped and fell and hurt your knee. You know, so that they can say no, that that didn't happen. So those are the four guidelines. Interview the children as soon as possible after the event. Encourage children to tell the truth. Describe the event in their own words. And ask questions that consider alternate explanations. So make sure you know those for the test. We're going to continue on to the next slide and look at how do we learn number skills. So let's take a look at that. So now let's go on to learning number skills. Do you remember when you learned numbers? Right? It's hard to imagine not ever knowing how to count and what numbers mean, but there's definitely a distinctive principle and learning process of counting of learning numbers. So let's take a look at it. What might a two-year-old's counting sound like? Disorganized, maybe not in the right order. Two, four, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> but they know that they're numbers. They know they need to go in some kind of order, and they know they have some kind of value. At five months, they found that infants can distinguish between two objects from three objects and three from four um, difference in quantity. So even at five months, there's some understanding that of numbers and value. So our brain is a miraculous thing. And because of that, we're putting that into, um, you know, those schemes, those categories. You know, our brain knows that red and blue are colors. Our brain knows that, you know, circles and triangles are shape. And our brain knows that small quality quantities and large quantities um, are different categories as well. So even at that young age, they understand, um, begin to understand and put them in those schemes. So by age two, most children have some basic counting skill. And we're gonna go over the three basic principles of counting. So the first one is one-to-one -one principle. So what that means is there's one and only one number for each object counted. So you'll see this when a child counts three objects. Even if they said 1 to A, they understand that um, this principle because they understand that that third object can't be a 2 or a 1. Even though it's a letter, it has its own value. So they understand that each um, object is not the same, that it has its own distinct value. And it needs to be counted respectively. So that's why it's not, they don't say 1, 2, 1. They understand, no, it's 1, 2, and some other value. So a number is just a, a symbol for that value. So until they learn and understand what number it is, any, any letter number sound would be, would, would mean the same. So they have to learn that three would be the next after two. But that one-to-one -one principle means that there's only one and only one number for each object counted. So you would never see a child go one to one who understands this principle. They would say one, two, three, one, two, A, one, two, five, at least not the same number repeated. The second basic principle of counting is stable order principle. And what that means is that number names must be counted in the same order. So you get a child who counts in the same sequence, for example, consistently counting four objects, 
one, two, four, five understands this principle. So even though we know that it should be one, two, three, four, they know that it's an order that they it's going higher to I mean lower to higher. So they know that the um, numbers must be in an order and it must make sense. You know, it must be counted in the same order. So lowest to highest, they know that the, each one has to be higher, even if it's not completely correct, as long as it's still going in the right direction that you, so they're obeying that principle. So if you saw someone go one, two, five, three, then they're not understanding that principle because it's going lower, higher, lower. They're not going in the same order. So that's a stable order. So this is the one of the main reasons that a lot of number rhymes were taught to children in nursery rhymes um, to emphasize the correct series of numbers repeatedly to the children, right? Can you think of that um, uh, nursery rhymes or number rhymes that, you know, were emphasized? One, two, buckle my shoe, you know, three, four. So all those kind of things to show that stable order matters that if you're going in the right in one direction it has to continue to go up or if you're going down it has to continue that pattern so let's take a look at how do they test this in infants how do we know that infants are learning number skills so infants uh so this is an example of sequence of events of one plus one equals one or two so let's take a look at it so First thing they do is they place an object on the stage. Then the screen comes up. Then they add a second object. Hand leaves empty. So they, they show the infant this. Then either possible outcome, right? Screen drops revealing two objects or impossible outcome. Screen drops revealing one object. So what they found, this is they tested this on five months old, is that Infants are surprised when they see objects added or removed, but the original number of objects is still present when the screen is removed. This pattern suggests basic understanding of addition and subtraction. So basically what they found is that they look at the wrong answer longer. So they're looking at that like, oh, how did that happen? So they consistently seen that in enough infants to infer that they're understanding some concept of addition and subtraction and realizing that that is an impossible outcome. So that's how they've done research on infants beginning to learn number skills. So the last of the three principles of counting is cardinality principle. And what that is, is the last number name differs from previous ones in a sequence by denoting the number of objects. And the book uses the example of a three-year-old counting one, two, three, four, five, eight, with the emphasis on the last number, showing that they understand that that means something, that that's the end of my counting, that's the number of objects I have in total, so that they're putting a value on that last number, meaning that's the total having significant meaning than the other ones. So that's the cardinality principle. So just think of it as that eager three-year-old counting, one, two, three, four, eight, and realizing that that means they have eight objects. So that last number means something. Um, and then also you have to remember when um, thinking about these three principles of counting, that these principles are not always accurate. Conventional sequence of numbers, names must be mastered along with the principles. So, you know, they get it wrong, right? Um, they understand kind of the concept, but they don't understand exactly, right? They get the sequence off. They don't have all the right numbers in order. So it has to come with um, mastering of these principles. So it's a process. So just remember that it's a process and that by age five, most can apply all the basic count counting principles one through three. So it takes to about age five to master them. So remember they start to learn them but they don't master them until the age of five. So by two years of age, most younger youngsters know some number words. So by two, they start to understand them. They begin to count. Counting is usually full of mistakes. They may count one, two, six, seven, uh, but 
but nevertheless, this, this counting reflects some of the um, understanding of the three basic principles of counting. So you just have to remember that understanding it and mastering it are two different things. So at age two, they're starting to understand and showing some mastery, but not until age five do they show universal mastering of all three uh, principles. And it varies by each, you know, uh, individual child. So these are just, again, ranges. But by five, you can see they can apply that. Most can apply all three mastery of these skills. And then by at age two, they're starting understanding with some mastery, but not consistent. Okay, so this ends the first part of uh, lecture four. So we're going to go, and the next time we're going to talk about the mind and culture and some more cognitive and um, psychological theories of the um, infant and young child, young toddler. So we're going to go to Vikoski. And we're going to learn about words and language and the road to speech. So that's the second part of chapter four. So I will see you then and have a great day.